The people that will succeed, I think, are those who continue to evolve and learn. I think we're definitely in an environment where what you graduated with is very unlikely to be the future. I think the value of human in the work context is how are they putting their skill sets to work in the best face for the organization that they're working with? What is the value that they're adding? I think so many of our institutions are still doing things the way they've been done for the last 30 years. And all they're doing is charging more for the same product. And that product has hmm. evolved. And and I, I think where we really need to move towards is making sure that students are aware and know that when they get out, their world is gonna change every few years. Okay, we're here with Jeff Cassidy. Jeff, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Drew. Awesome, Jeff, could we just kick off, maybe take a minute to introduce yourself and how you landed at the Flatiron School. Sure, I'm happy to go through my background briefly. I have been at Flatiron School for a little over a year, and my road to Flatiron School is, is probably not the most traditional. I have been in every kind of industry you can imagine. I've started in financial services. I've spent some time in biotech. I've moved over to the restaurant industry spent some time in travel, and now I'm here at the Flatiron School where we're doing technical training for, for individuals looking to upskill their careers. Absolutely. And you're CFO there, correct? I am the CFO here. So tell me just a little bit, I was fascinated when we initially spoke just about the mission of the Flatiron School in general, the space it's in, and why it's so important. Great, great to talk through the importance of uh, where Flatiron School sits in, in our current world and environment. Flatiron School has been around for 10 years. It started traditionally as a B2, B2C upskilling program where people who are stuck in a particular career that they might not have liked, being able to provide them with technical skills in a very short period of time, a few months, where they're able to learn skills in data science, software engineering, cybersecurity. And over the years, the, the businesses continue to evolve and provide really great outcomes for individuals in this space, trying to change their trajectory of, of where they are. And one of, the, one of the cooler ways that we've tried to actually implement this at a broader scale is engaging with enterprises. So where enterprises have a much larger reach to their to their employee base who also are trying to upskill or retrain or move along as this, as this sort of economy evolves. Uh, I think it's an evolving quicker every day. Artificial intelligence is going to continue to probably aid people's jobs. Some of our bread and butter is really taking folks that may have a college degree, may not, and they're looking to get into software engineering. So they're moving from a job where they don't see, where they don't see potential and they might not be making as much money as they want to make. And going through our programs uh, really helps them get a leg up and, and start their career and say software engineering, where perhaps they were working in the restaurant industry, making forty or fifty thousand dollars a year. They go through our program for a few months, and all of a sudden they are getting job offers for seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars to to start. And you're in the technology world; you understand that really is a starting point, and they can make their career how they want it from there. So we're really changing people's individuals and families' trajectory of where where they can land. Yeah, that's fantastic and super rewarding work, I'm sure, when you know you've impacted someone's life. When we think about this upskilling, retraining, there's so much chatter. You just mentioned AI. Are you seeing a specific cohort or generation of worker leaning into this type of upskilling and retraining or the businesses you're, you're working with finding a need to educate? Is it older workers, younger workers? Could you tell us about that? So our, our business really works with other enterprises to educate all sorts of employees. So we have a really great partnership with Amazon with their career choice program. So they have a great benefit for all their frontline workers because they know that they're not likely to stay at Amazon in their factory and warehouses for their whole career. But what they want to do is provide a great opportunity while they're there and then being able to set them up for success after that. So we've actually partnered with Amazon for the last few years in that program where they are providing a benefit to their employees to take our programs and they're able to leave Amazon. That's one of their success metrics is that they're able to get additional new jobs after working with Amazon and Amazon's happy with that outcome. So we're helping them in software engineering, cybersecurity on that sort of that frontline worker perspective, really looking for that leg up. 
We also work with other enterprises who are looking to take existing employees and reskill them so that they have additional additional skill sets to, to move on in their career. I've worked at a multinational where folks might have started in sales. They have a, an idea that they'd like to move into technology, but they don't really know how to. So we can work with organizations who are, again, trying to retain talent who might be vital to their current organization, but they might individually see a cap to where they're going with that company. And then we're able to provide the training and set them up for success. So we work with from the frontline workers of Amazon to companies like Deloitte and KPMG, who are working already with more white collar workers, just yes. looking to expand their expand their skill sets and, and figure out where what's next for them. Absolutely. What sorts, just curious around, you must be following trends around what sorts of skills or competencies are evolving could you maybe just give us some insight into what's popular today and where you see those green shoots in the future? Sure. Historically, our business has, has been heavy on uh, software engineering training, and we've always offered multiple disciplines. We are seeing an increased interest in cybersecurity and data science. The data science angle really teaches all the building blocks of what current day artificial intelligence, chat GPT, all the basics that it's built off of. Our, our programs don't teach specifically to any one any one product, but it really lays the groundwork for individuals. So on the consumer side, we are seeing people interested in data science and cybersecurity. On the enterprise side, we're seeing more and more people interested in our cybersecurity programs as that's just becoming such an important aspect for all large organizations, small organizations as well, but large ones are really focused on sort of their data security and, and understanding how to keep their data safe, their employees safe, et cetera. So I'd say cybersecurity and data science are, are certainly seeing an increase there. Absolutely. Now you're working with folks all over their career journey. Right. And I'm sure there are some that it's right at the beginning of their career journey, as you mentioned, right? They may have got a degree in something like philosophy, for instance, and not necessarily made that calculation of what is the return on investment of this. Can you maybe talk a little bit about the next generation of workers? What sorts of skills and competencies do you think businesses will covet in the future? And therefore, what sorts of skills or competencies should people younger in their career or yet to start their career be thinking about? Great question. As you think through where the workforce of the future is, there's going to continue to be evolution of technologies. There's going to be the need to adapt their individual working styles. I've been set most of my career in, in finance. I can see a lot of things around the corner where we'll be able to start leveraging technology in a much greater way so that the finance organization and traditional accounting roles probably do change over time. And you're able to use technology to make jobs more efficient and, and get, actually get at business insights quicker and faster. The people that will succeed, I think, are those who continue to evolve and learn. I think we're definitely in an environment where what you graduated with is very unlikely to be the future. I think that's been for a while. Uh, you mentioned a philosophy major. I, I think many folks who go into philosophy are very interested in it and probably have some of the more interesting coursework to during their university years. But at the end of the day, trying to figure out what to do with that philosophy degree is, is challenging. But I think philosophy major would be fantastic. Again, really curious about the world, really curious about how to learn new things. So I think it's going to be an ever evolving situation where whatever you started with probably is not what you're going to end up with. I'm actually a fair example. I was a, a marketing major and here I am as a chief financial officer. So sure. um, I, I think regardless of what you start out at the age of 18, you can probably guarantee that's probably not what you're going to be doing when you're 38 or 48 or, or certainly 58. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's so many, I love that you just said that your journey, it's, do you really know where you're going? You read the signals and follow, right? And and you end up on a career path. Thinking about that and thinking about the incentives of that journey, both for the business and the individual, I want to shift our conversation a bit to the concept of value. And on his face, I'm really curious to get your perspective as a CFO, because you're looking at cost of your business as well. Human capital, human resources is our largest expense line item. So how would you answer this question or help folks start to comprehend it? What's the value of a human in the work context? Wow, that's a very deep question there. The value, what is the value of a human in the work context? I think the value of a human in the work context is how are they putting their skill sets to work in the best face for the organization that they're working with? What is the value that they're adding? And I think regardless of the department, somebody is working in, I think that will also continue to blur lines mm. as we evolve. I think different departments will be responsible for different things. I think individuals who 
are peeling back the onion, whether you're in customer service, sales, or finance. I think all the sort of the, the business insights that a human is delivering, I think at least in the near term, are still going to be more valuable than the insights that a computer is going to generate for you because you don't have the touch and feel of where that business is going. I'll use one example. In my prior career at EF Education First, very large organization, lots of great people working there, lots of people with their first jobs. Again, you mm -hmm. don't really know what your career trajectory looks like at your first job. There were a number of people that I actually brought in from our customer service department into the finance and strategy organization because they were sitting at the front line with the data with customers and really synthesizing what customers were looking for. And you could get a sense that these were really analytical folks and, and they were learning on their own what that meant to analyze a business, figure out what the impact was that they were having on the organization. And after approaching them for more strategy type roles, it, they weren't things they considered before, but using leveraging the skill sets they had and the interest that they had, it was a perfect, a perfect fit. There were a number of customer service folks that I brought into to finance and strategy over the years because they were leveraging their expertise, working with customers, and then figuring out where they had some really great talent on digesting the data and presenting it in a good way. So I think the value you're bringing is really wherever you sit in the organization, figuring out how to bring up the micro level to the macro impacts of the business. Would love to evolve that thought and really appreciate that comprehensive answer. When you think about, now, if we flip it from the business context and thinking about the value, when you think about the individual, we have the notion of there's like hard skills, whether that's like being certified in something or having a technical ability like computer programming or being able to run marketing campaigns. And then we have obviously the notion of soft skills. When you think about soft skills and you think about the future and proliferation of technology, what skills do you think are going to be most valued? Great. So as we think about soft skills and hard skills evolving into the future, I think you're going to see a couple of different evolutions. I think the hard skills will continue to be supplemented with technology. So you're actually going to be able to have much more computing power, much more help on some of the hard skills. I think the soft skills are going to be the ones that continue to evolve and going to be really critically important to both understand from a customer's perspective what they're looking for in your products and your services, being able to translate that into what is the value you're going to provide to the customer and individual. I think that technology is going to be pretty far away from being able to fully transition that for a period of time. Mm -hmm. the, the area on the soft skills that we all have to evolve and I'm evolving in this is really, we grew up interacting face-to-face in person, building relationships in a more actual present state. Yeah. Uh, I think as we figure out how we evolve our soft skills online and we're, we're sitting here, not in the studio together, we're sitting in our own apartments or houses. And I think figuring out how to translate what potentially was successful in an in-person working environment into a remote environment are going to be some of the biggest things. Lots of companies are figuring out what to do, what's the future of work? Is it in person? Is it hybrid? Is it remote? I, I'm not making a prediction of where that stands. I do know that we, it was the cat is out of the bag. Lots of work will be remote. You will have mm -hmm. a lot of workers remote. Yeah. And I think being able to bridge the the gap of you relied on FaceTime, you relied on in-person understanding what people's work was doing. But how do you separate yourself remotely when you're sitting in your living room, your boss might be sitting 3000 miles away from you, not exactly sure what you're doing all day long, but what is the value you're providing and seeing around those corners, just the same you would have if you were in person. But I think those people who are motivated to really continue to try to solve business problems. Um, yeah and make themselves visible as much as they can in the work product, not necessarily visible in seeing each other face to face, but making sure your work product is speaking for yourself. Yeah. I love that concept of just saying, using the word visible or making visibility without actually being present used in the term too, which I love present state. So thinking about that a little more, I like my brain goes to, but how do we measure it? And so as we move from this world where machines are doing more of the transactional and tactical components of work, humans are doing the more relational, right? The more subjective components. Just curious to know if you've done any work or, or dabbled in and curious to get your perspective. Like I view the space of performance measurement and I just think it's woefully unsophisticated as it is, right? Where all we all have like our performance reviews and we're trying to use like peer feedback to be like, are they good? Are they not? Right. And each business is different. 
And so when we think about this new age, if I'm working at home and I'm not enjoying where I'm working, it's not hard to go find another job because I don't have to worry about changing my commute, right? There's more leverage in the employee's hand. But if I learned that this is what performance looks like at one company, even if I'm doing the same exact role at another company, the performance standard's different, right? So just curious, what do you think all, all of what we're talking about, the, what is the implication? What does the future of performance measurement look like to you? The future performance measurement is certainly interesting as we try to, evolve, I think every company, and I've worked in several different companies, everybody treated performance management slightly differently. Some had more emphasis on it. Others had less emphasis on it. Some were more focused on the soft skills. Some were more focused on the, the hard technical skills. And I think to have a similar to job titles across companies, companies. Nobody, you could look at the same job title and you might be doing something completely different from one business to the next. I, I yeah. think the, the performance uh, measurements are, are going to continue to be important. And I would put a lot of that on the employee. It's It goes both ways. I think the employee, as they're evaluating a new place to work, really understanding what it is that they're going to be measured against. Because if they're coming from a place where they're, again, similar job title, but they were measured much more on, on velocity of output, as opposed to potential quality of that output, understanding the operation that they're moving into, what are they going to be focused on? Is that something that they want to strive for? So yeah. even as you think about companies coming up with their mission, vision, et cetera, in this sort of new landscape, I think a lot of it should be based around what are the expectations around performance? And it's a, yeah. a fully transparent viewpoint where if you ask anybody on your team, what are the goals? What are the things that you're moving the needle on? And how does that translate into the company's vision? If they can't articulate that in a reasonably succinct way, then I think there's a miscommunication there. So a lot of it stems from the company understanding where they're going, making sure that all the way down to the individuals, they're actually having goals and performance metrics yeah. tied to that. Because otherwise, what's the point of the work that they're doing if it's not contributing to the overall broader plan that you have for a business? So sure. as a business leader, we need to be able to articulate that to the employees that what they're working on, how they're impacting the rest of the organization. And as an employee, asking that and understanding I'm doing this. It, it seems like I'm wasting a lot of time and, and let's have a conversation because maybe you are wasting a lot of time and let's make sure everything we're doing makes sense as to why you're doing it. Yeah, no, very well said. Curious to get your perspective in your position as a chief financial officer. What are some metrics that come to mind right now today that are measurable, trackable when you think about the return on human resource investment? So as I think about where the return on investment for sort of individual human resources has to come through with what are the jobs? How do you actually look at what needs to be done? So every business needs, there, there are certain roles that it's hard to ascribe value beyond you need to have that role. So you're going to need to have somebody in the IT department being able to manage and monitor what's happening to infrastructure for the business. Where that person can add value is taking a look beyond what is the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling on that and understanding what additional value are they adding. So if they're responsible for IT infrastructure, sure, we're up and running 24-7. Like those are table stakes. Make sure everything is humming along. The employees are able, the rest of the employee base is able to do their jobs. But beyond that, where else can you add value? And I think those are the employees that will continue to be rewarded and stay with an organization because they're adding value beyond what the direct job description is of that person. I'd say it's the same for the accountants that are on my team. Yes, I expect them to close the books every month and do the bank reconciliations. Those are like the basic blocking and tackling that perhaps someday does get done by a machine. So really where are you adding the value is taking a look at what piece that you're working on, where can you influence the rest of the business? And, sure. and it's not just the bank reconciliation, but it's taking a look at what do these numbers really mean? Where are their save, potential savings? Where are you seeing some leakage and in, in potential mm -hmm. revenue? There's lots of different things. And, and I think that as you look at the value of an individual player, it's really difficult to see a standard salary band. I think mm -hmm. that's where we're, we, we struggle with that going forward is what is a standard salary band? I know this is close to your heart. You have somebody who's a software engineer engineer and they can do five times the amount of production that another software engineer can do. So how do you look at them and say, the well, salary band for that is 100 
and 20,000 yeah. to 175,000. I think those are the things that we're still pretty far away, I think, from being able to get out of our own way with some of that. So ingrained in organizations that this is what we pay for a software engineer. And that's the challenge. What's fascinating about that is that the majority of the riskiest part of the employment the contractual employment relationship is that initial bid or offer. Once you get past that, there aren't a whole lot of exorbitant, typically earning opportunities. Maybe their stock and compensation. When we look at salary itself, it's like that big bet up front. So much more about an employee a year in <laughs> and their worth. So if we were to back, take this thought and back it up and let's say we're going to hire, let's call it an engineer, we're, we're going to hire an individual. Really what we're trying to do is place a value on how valid we think their experience is in the situation, but also any elasticity there is predicated on what future value do we think they can provide, right? So how do you, like in the CFO seat, I know you, you CFOs interact with HR all the time on like, rationalizing that band. And by the way, now that we're seeing pay transparency laws come out, people are setting a job can be paid anywhere. I saw the other day between a hundred thousand and nine hundred and ninety nine thousand dollars. And it was like, <laughs> that's not a solution. But so how can you rationalize such elasticity? What are some of the factors or components you look for in the individual to help you predict or to be okay paying someone two X more than someone else? So I think as you think about salary transparency and paying people fairly for the work they're doing and comparing one output versus another is a super complicated formula that historically there might be a 10 or 15% delta of the person's salary when potentially the work output might be a hundred times better or 50% better than the other one. So I think there's actually a lot of challenges of removing some pre-existing history in all of our minds as far as what exactly that person is producing for us. There's going to be salary bands that exist, there's salary data that people will benchmark themselves against. And I think that's, that is important so people understand that the value that they're giving to organization is really what is the organization willing to pay for that service? Um, mm -hmm. And I think with a lot of the large tech layoffs, unfortunately, I think there's going to be a lot of folks that will take a long time, if ever, to achieve the type of earnings that they were getting at some of those large tech companies. So in Silicon Valley, when you see some of these computer engineers or AI folks making five, $600,000 a year, they were working for some of the largest companies in the world, and they had the ability to pay that rate. I think you have less ability to pay. They might be worth it. I think that you, you end up with a balance of how much is somebody's worth versus how much individual organization can actually pay to, mm. to get that. It's similar to almost, uh, not the best analogy, but if you think about sports teams that have salary caps, you only have so much money. So you have to figure out where best to allocate it unless that individual is directly tied to additional revenue earnings, which right. makes it easier to potentially outpay on more of a obvious salesperson, yeah. but it's underlying a lot of the technology, how much of that is ascribed to those additional sales right. that the person was able to make. So I think we need to break down some pre-existing notions of what salaries are. We need to understand that there are people who do a lot more in the same amount of yeah. time th than other folks and, and figure out how best to value that. But every organization is going to have some constraints with what their resources actually are to be able to pay for that. At the end of the day, it becomes a little bit of an internal sort of analysis oh, absolutely. Of, of where you can go with that. I'm sure there's a lot of great talent on the market that was making $500,000 that many organizations would love to have them. They just actually can't justify it in their current budget. No, very well said. And as you were just saying about Silicon Valley, tech companies, there's so much tension currently, right? In the between the employee and employer. And clearly the news cycle, because news cycles love to fear monger a bit. It's this message of like corporate greed, and now we can just lay anyone off. The desire to push humans out of the process, right? That's what corporations are doing. Let's just push humans out because we can optimize with technology, right? That's being careless about people. That's what's happening. And I've even heard some people go as far to say as they don't think meaningful work exists. And if it did, it doesn't exist anymore. Essentially, are we all just like getting by and trying to get a paycheck and move on? Like, how do these sentiments resonate with you? Sure, there was a lot there to unpack. So yep. I'll actually start with more the, the latter of what you said, sort of purpose to the work that you're doing. I can just give a sort of personal anecdote for me. My first sort of corporate role was in consumer finance. And we were working with giving credit cards out to individuals and then patch, packaging up that debt on Wall Street and selling it to somebody else who would give you a, a coupon payment on the, the results of that. And that, there, there was nothing that I could tangibly look at and say, I'm adding like 
value to the world necessarily as I looked at that. And then as I took my stock of what I want to do next, that's where I landed into biotech because that was something that I felt even in the, I was doing finance. I wasn't touching the chemicals or figuring out how to solve diseases, but you felt sort of the work that generally was being done at the business was, was helpful and productive. Mm-hmm. For me, it was motivating to understand where, where your time was being spent. So I think for me, I will always want to feel a sense of purpose, at least in the what the business is that I'm working for, even in my journey after my last company, before I joined Flatiron School, that was one of the the critical components. Like what I'm going to work for, I want to feel like I would be, could be an honest salesperson for that product, even if I'm not in sales. Is it something I can feel good about at the end of the day? And I think that's a good check for me, but I think everybody's different. There are a lot of folks that are going in there making sure that they have the right salary that they need to support the rest of their life. And that's fine too. I think there's always going to be a segment of the population that is doing work to do work. And then there are others that are doing work to do work. Plus they want to feel some sort of sense of purpose with that. But if your purpose is to be able to support your three kids and whichever industry is going to pay you the most to be able to do that in the best of your ability, that is your purpose in some ways. Like your purpose is to make sure you're supporting your family. And I think that can't get lost as well. There's That's part of also being a leader and manager, understanding sort of the reasons why the people are working for you and working for your mm-hmm. company and, and what's important to them and, and making sure that you're meeting their expectations. And yeah, every human is different. Everybody's going to do it differently. That's right. I think a younger me would say I would do anything for a larger paycheck. That's just not true. Like you you go through life and and there's other things that pop up that become more important to you. But I think every stage of life, you reevaluate what your career means, what your earnings mean, and who knows where that actually ultimately is. But I think it would be sad if everybody was just working for the paycheck and there wasn't some meaning behind what what you're trying to accomplish. So let's speak about career development for a second. Most career development services today, and I would say probably like 99% of them are subsidized by the employer, not the employee. And you even just talked about too, how Flatiron School is doing more work with larger companies. In that way, the business is always the primary beneficiary. If you're like, hey, I think I have a, a this talent, right? And it's if it doesn't align with what the business wants, you're probably not going to get that funded. And so we run the risk a little bit, I think, of getting pigeonholed or because we're only doing what is allowed in the org, we could end up somewhere that maybe wasn't our destiny or naturally suited with us anyways. And if we take this a step further in the conversation that we've been having with between the employee and employer relationship, even the notion of a talent agency today, there are not talent agencies, they're business agencies. They represent businesses who have jobs open to find talent, right? Do you think we'll start to see a shift to more direct to employee services in the future because of all that's happening? As I think about professional development and career training going on into the future, I think the challenge becomes enterprises or the organizations are the easiest path to get a large audience of people who are going to take your training. I think Mm. there are a lot of companies and organizations trying to figure out that individual direct to consumer, like how are we training them? How are we learning? How are we helping them learn in their career? And I think there are a lot of great services for that. Flatiron being one of them as well, where individuals can come to us. What an organization does is remove the barrier of entry in terms of the pay. So you don't have to pay the tuition if your organization is going to pay for it. As far as trainings go, I know lots of folks who are fully self-trained on a very shoestring budget with the resources online. So there's always going to be the folks that are really self-motivated and could do it on their own and figure out the right paths to do it online. I think the other folks potentially can look at organizations who are offering these types of benefits if that's something that they find important to them and think about it as a compensation package. One of the areas that you might be leaning towards is uh, is you actually have people doing a lot more fractional work. Mm -hmm. They might be working for a few different companies at the same time. A lot of people doing different side hustles and and trying to work their way to maximize the the work-life balance. And I think you'll see the probably the largest problem with organizations like Flatiron School or others like us getting at individual customers is really the marketing cost that it takes to actually reach to them to know for the, consumer, to, for the consumer to know that's even an option that's out there. There's only so many ways and avenues that currently 
companies like ours reach out to individual consumers. But I think that's probably one of the barriers that it just costs a lot to get individuals to know about your product. Whereas you can spend a much more focused effort at getting some large organizations to know about your product okay. and, and they can disseminate that to their employee base. That's a fascinating thought too. It could actually be a, like an economic, like a limiting factor, right? And perhaps it's a signal that the space just isn't there yet. Yeah. 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 If you think about, yeah, if you think about any sort of mass mass media or mass advertising it's really expensive and if your product isn't appealing to a mass audience our product for one is not appealing to a mass audience not everybody wants to be a software engineer or data scientist yeah so for us to go super broad and advertise to everybody it doesn't really make so much sense but our products are out there and amazing for the folks that it's really interesting to absolutely really great thought as we're wrapping up here so you just mentioned freelance fractional work right this is really i think paving the way for revolutionizing what the new employee employer contract will look look like in the future upwork just announced you can now engage workers full-time on their platform there's also a rising trend in like news chatter and signals about union conversations. Those are starting to hit the news cycles again. So there's obviously a lot of tension out there. And now we have this added notion of the employee employer, like the actual legal contracts could be different. What are your thoughts? What do you think this says about the, the future of at-will employment? So the future of at-will employment is already interesting in the United States because prior I've worked in global organizations where they would look at the way we operated in the U.S. as crazy to begin with, that somebody has no contract on either side. They could give you your notice today and, and leave today. There's no requirement for somebody to give two weeks notice. So that creates, when I would talk to my counterparts in Europe, they just thought it was nuts. I actually, there was one time somebody gave me one month's notice and I was excited. They gave me a good amount of time to figure things out. And when I would talk to my counterparts, they're like, one month, that's so short. Like, how do you solve it in that short period of time? And so I think what happens is the US has already been operating on that where you always have to have a backup plan in your head because mm -hmm. there isn't a timeline guaranteed. And I think Europe has always had a little bit more of a timeline guaranteed, even at junior roles where somebody has to is contractually obligated on both sides. An employee, an employer can't just fire them and walk out the door and an employee has to give reasonable notice in, in most cases. So I think on the fractional work side, it will help businesses. If people are interested in that, I think it helps business flex up and down as needs arise. I think yeah. in, the, in the marketing world, there's going to be time where you're, you're really trying to push forward several different campaigns, you might only have a certain amount of designers in-house, in, in you're able to really flex up, and then you don't have a structural cost going forward. And it's for those folks who they're fine with that. They take on new work for a few months, right. and they look at something else. So I, I think companies should figure out the best way to leverage those folks who want to do that. But I do think there's still going to be a real value in your core employee base and focus on making sure you're doing the best by your core employee base and utilize the fractional workers as that sort of flex up and flex down and being able to meet demand where needed. I think Upwork is a great platform for those folks who are trying to strike it out on their own. I think 10 years ago, if you wanted to be a, a web designer on your own, where are you getting get your customers from? Like, how do you solve that? I think a lot of these platforms have been really helpful to the individual who is trying to put together a book of business and is okay with a little bit of instability because they don't know where their next paycheck is coming from, maybe. But it allows them the freedom and flexibility to live where they want, to spend their day how they want, sure. work in where they want. So I think it's going to be a marriage between you will still have a lot of core employees, but I think you'll start seeing businesses supplement some of their, instead of potentially over hiring, try to leverage some of these additional options. Jeff, just one more question for you. This conversation about upskilling, retraining is going to just always be there, right? <laughs> Never going to change. When you think about the responsibility, right? Is it corporations and businesses responsibility for upskilling and retraining, especially those that may be displaced by technologies like AI now, it could be something else in 20 years? Or do you think it's more so the responsibility of governments. That's a heavy question, Jerry. So is reskilling on the shoulders of governments or on the shoulders of businesses? And I would add the third, is it just on the shoulders of the individual? I find it hard for the government to do it effectively. If you're going to say an entire industry is displaced and the government comes in and comes up with their best laid plans, I don't see that actually effectively happening. So perhaps it's a could potentially be a partnership 
with government and organizations if they know if there's something happening. But I cringe at the thought of <laughs> the, any government around, not just the U.S. government, but any government around the world actually being the ones who are going to come in and say, this is actually how we're going to train the next generation of workforces. I just don't think that the it's too individualistic to say that this is going to be some worldwide program or some global program. Even if you just simply look at the way current education is in the U.S., both through high school and, and then through college, where the historical patterns have been, what's been important and what's going forward. I think you already see that universities, traditional K through 12, a lot of them have fallen behind the times as far as what's important to, yeah. to have. What, what are the skill sets for somebody to have coming out of school? So if we can't catch up at the beginning, I'm not really sure how you pivot if all of a sudden you've displaced a bunch of 30 something year olds in an industry and you say the government's going to be able to solve this. I just don't see that. I think there's going to be, it's most likely going to be a combination of individuals figuring out where that is and then organizations spending the time to retain employees that are really good and help them craft a new career within their organization. But that's going to only be able to happen at probably some of the largest organizations. There's just not necessarily funding at some of the smaller ones, which is where potentially there's some government subsidies that might come into play. If you're willing to sponsor X amount of employees for this type of rough type of new skill set, we'll provide some tax credits or tax subsidies in, in that perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And this is an interesting thought there. If there's one shot that the government would have, it would be through the educational system, right? And I don't, yeah. And that's not, I think our educational system is not preparing it's not tuned students. for this. <laughs> not preparing students enough today. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that thought. As we wrap up here, th is there anything you were hoping that we would talk about that you didn't get to touch on today? So as I looked at sort of our agenda and potential potential topics of where we landed, no, I think I'm happy with the discussion that we had. The area that I still think is something probably is more on the university and, and high school side of preparing students for this. Yeah. One of the first questions you asked me, what are going to be the, some of the key skill sets? I think it is really building that lifelong learner mindset and also building that that skill set to be able to thrive in an ever-changing world. I think so many of our institutions are still doing things the way they've been done for the last 30 years. And all they're doing is charging more for the same product. And that product has mm. evolved. And I, I think where we really need to move towards is making sure that students are aware and know that when they get out, their world is going to change every few years, probably, depending on where yeah. they're, what career they choose from the, right out of the gate, probably won't be a career in five or 10 years. And that's okay. Like it's making it okay for people to not know what their 20 years from now looks like is going to be important. Yeah, that's a fantastic thought. We had a labor economist on the show a few days ago, and they actually were talking about there's a phenomenon of STEM majors, right? Whether you're engineering or mathematics typically come out and have starting salaries ahead of their fellow graduates. However, the plateau and drop in future earnings is precipitous. So it's you go up and then it's like, whoa, where's everyone else begin earns through their career? And that's just because these technologies are just so rapidly evolving so much faster. So it just made me think about that. But as we think about our future earning potential, what we choose as a career may actually, to, to your point, the notion of continuous learning and not just learning us. In those cases, I think it's like re-education is needed. Now, it is fascinating where you see a lot of these studies published of what's the highest earning salary of a graduate. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of people might just focus on that. I want to go do that because that's how I'm going to make the most money. But if you actually think about when you or I graduated from college, there are jobs today that didn't exist when we got out that make more money than we could have imagined at that point. So there are entire new work products that didn't exist before. And I can imagine 10 years from now, there'll be additional jobs jobs that currently don't exist today, but will be very high earning jobs in the future. So how do you make sure you're able to pivot towards that if it's interesting to you and to continue to maximize your own sort of financial future? That's right. Awesome. Jeff, thanks so much for uh, joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much, Drew. Happy to be here.